This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tung. With me, we have special guest Miguel Valderabano, the first author of a blockbuster new trial, The Venus Trial, that just got released yesterday in JAMA, looking at the role of the vein of Marshall and atrial fibrillation, injection of alcohol into the vein of Marshall. Welcome, Miguel. Thank you. Congratulations, first of all. This is a huge study. It's a paradigm shift. It's new. It's novel for our field. And it's awesome to be able to have electrophysiology represented in the Journal of American, the Journal of American Medical Association. So congratulations Thank again you. to you and your co-authors. Can you tell us a little bit about how this whole story started for you? This has been a long journey for you. It has been. Uh, this started with a casual conversation with one of my colleagues uh, here in Houston in 2007 that um, I had the idea. Um, he was asking me about something completely unrelated and, and you know, one of those moments. Um, we all have ideas. Some of them don't survive an overnight sleep, but this one did. And the interesting thing is, I, ha I also, obviously I was aware of the Veno Marshall and ligament of Marshall in a fib because of my work with Peng Cheng. Although when I was uh, with him during training, um, he was my mentor. I never worked in the vein of Marshall. I never, I never really uh, was part of that project. I was aware of it. Some of my colleagues, some of my co-fellows participated in it. Um, I actually didn't care much about it. Um, but when when the idea came up that we could put we could try to put a balloon in there and ablate those the structures that are associated with the vein of Marshall and ligament of Marshall, I thought it was cute that we could come up with a strategy to make that information that mechanistic information that Peng Cheng and Ben Sherlock had ob obtained decades before into a clinically relevant procedure. So you know. Like I, like I told you, we all have ideas and many of them don't survive an overnight sleep. This one did. Um, I got a small grant from uh, the Houston Texans. The football team was giving money to the Heart Center. I don't know exactly how that came about, uh, but they gave me some money for animal studies and, and we did those and it seemed to work. We struggled. It, it, in canines, the, um, the main of Marshall is, is harder to accumulate than in humans. But you know, it was doable. Uh, we showed that we could get an ablation in the expected area. And we actually showed that we had some uh, regional parasympathetic innervation. So with those data in mind, I, I asked for uh, IRB approval for a first in man study and Methodist rejected flat out uh, the first submission. I resubmitted. Uh, Giving more data. I actually, I think I might have gone to the IRB and presented the rationale. And they said, we'll approve one patient. Do one patient, send us a report, and then we'll see one by one, we would approve up, up to the 10 that I had requested. So the first patient, I get there, he agrees. I explain the whole story. Um, we um, get a venogram of the coronary sinus. I see he's got a good vein of Marshall. I get a wire. And then during those days, alcohol, uh, alcohol ablation of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy had been very, very hot in this institution back in the in the early 90s. So there was a lot of expertise in, in alcohol ablation in general. And one of my colleagues suggested that I give echocardiographic contrast in the vein of Marshall. And when I injected the contrast in the vein of Marshall on intracardiac echo, I, I saw the entire left atrial cavity get white. So I freaked out because I did not want to give a bolus of alcohol into the left atrium. <clears throat> so, you know, I said, well, what do I do? Should I not do it? Should I do it? Anyway, I did it very slowly. Then I repeated, I gave two injections and I had a nice area of ablation. Anyway, gave a report to the IRB and one by one, we got those 10 patients done. Then we had to apply for an IND. Uh, the FDA needs to, um, to approve the use of new drugs. So I don't know if they had the idea that I, I had commercial interest in getting a new indication for alcohol. Anyway. Long story short, um, I had to apply for an IND uh, at the FDA, which took me nine months. And I applied for a small grant at the NIH. Again, it was rejected. I reapplied and then I got the, the top grant of that, st that study section meeting. I got some money for a two year study where we did mechanistic studies on, on mitralismus ablation with, um, 
with alcohol in the vein of Marshall and denervation studies in humans and um, a study on recurrent, so failed ablations to look at whether the vein of Marshall was playing a role in those. So with three studies in humans where we showed the um, value in mitralismus ablation, the parasympathetic denervation and the, um, the role in pulmonary vein reconnections, then we applied for an R01 at the NIH uh, for a large clinical trial. And the gland was destroyed the first time. Um, I had to, I, I, I had no training in, in serious clinical research. Uh, so I had done my, my research, as you know, at UCLA at Cedars in, in basic science, but this was new to me and I made a bunch of rookie mistakes. Anyway, I got some help from experts in this and I reapplied at the funding. And then, you know, you get the funding, it's a high five moment. And then you realize you have to get, you know, 350 patients. The, work, the work's just getting years. started once you get the funding. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, was, it was like all of a sudden, I get a panic attack. How am I going to enroll so many patients? You know, I've said I, I could enroll 100 in my own institution. I don't even know that's the case. I mean, I thought I could. But anyway, we started and we went through some rough, rough times. Uh, the first patient was enrolled. So the very first patient ever to get vein of alcohol was in May 2008. The very first patient that we enrolled in the Venus trial was in October 2013. And halfway through it, in 2015, um, we were about 30% of expected enrollment. So for those out there that are struggling to enroll, <laughs> we all go through this. Uh, and 30% of expected enrollment was alarming enough to the NIH that they called me and they said, we will stop funding unless you come up with a plan, you know, and you come up with a plan, which is, yeah, I'll try harder. Or I'll get new sites and I will ask for people, you know, ask for help, but you know, this is the kind of thing that nobody can help you. It's not a matter of friendship. If so, we ended up opening a bunch of sites, ended up a, a total of 12. We started initially with us, uh, Andrea Natale in Austin and here at the VA, uh, Iraqi Georg Berizzi was the EP, being part of it, I needed to open more sites. And I opened San Diego, and friends, this is like friends and family that, that <laughs> wanted to help. Not family, but a bunch of friends from Cedars ended up uh, being part of this study, Raul Doshi, Charles Hadhill, and, um, and then Vijay Swarup in Arizona was instrumental because he enrolled at a pace that was comparable to ours and, and basically got us through that, that really struggling time when we were not enrolling. And then the NIH saw that we had, they gave us a hard, a hard deadline. They said, if you don't enroll 200 patients by uh, January 2017, we stop. And, um, and we did. Um, and then once you get the ball rolling, you know, we, were, we had to request an, uh, an extension of the, of the grant, but um, it took us, 10 months longer than we had planned, but uh, we got it done. And um, the nice thing about this is that I was always optimistic that, you know, with the complexity of persistent AFib, which is obviously a very complex disease that is, you know, it's, it's inconceivable that there's a single magic bullet for everyone, right? But I thought that um, the technique had value. I thought maybe not for everybody, but there were cases every now and then that would make me really optimistic when you would get a nice mitralismus ablation. And it, not all the cases are like that. And, but there were enough cases that were encouraging that kept my faith going. And, and I could see, you know, when like DJ Swarup in Arizona would call me and it's like, Miguel, your thing works. I had this, this great case and it was amazing. That didn't happen every time, but every now and then it would work. So the faith never, never really uh, declined, and that got us through. Well, I think that's an awesome story because for those that just all of a sudden see a paper in JAMA, they're like, wow, that's great. I can do the same. Well, that just shows you the road, the path, the journey. And then for you to get NIH funding, it's rare these days in the field of ablation to really have NIH funded and have it be investigated initiated. So again, I want to congratulate you and, and thank you for the backstory on that. Um, it's really fantastic, and we look forward to discussing more about the Venus and the Mars trial coming out as well.